there is a Zimbabwean saying that goes like mudanga amugare maburu maviri anototungana chat you can't keep two raging bulls in one herd they will definitely fight the Zimbabweans made the grave mistake of fighting for independence divided having two different armies from one country fighting to liberate the same country with the intention of leading that country is a recipe for disaster this was a ticking time bomb one that would explode in the early 80s and zimbabwe still hasn't moved on from that explosion till this day Well well fellow sadza eaters slay queens and bingers socialites papa lights vasnama lights varkujga rice never snama rights welcome to the special report Today we're going to take a look at the darkest period in Zimbabwe's history since independence the Gukurahundi massacres we are going to look at what happened how it happened and we'll attempt to answer the question of why it happened we will look at the relationship of zanu and the military the role of the zimbabwean defense forces in zimbabwean politics and why the zdf remains the biggest threat to ed outside politics but to understand gukurahundi and the involvement of the zdf in zimbabwean politics one needs to first of all understand three things the zanu philosophy the patriotic front and integration understanding these three things particularly the zanu philosophy will help us understand why zanu pf is a stronghold in rural areas it will also help us understand why robert mugabe hated pf zapu and why the death of tongogara might have paved way for the gukurahundi killings But of course I know that many of you don't like history at all. I know that you find it very boring to listen to stories from the past, but I implore you to be patient a little bit. Please give me the grace to dig deep. Trust me. Believe me. You can't holistically understand Gukurahundi without understanding the Zanu Zanla relationship, particularly their founding philosophy, because this philosophy is what birthed Zanu's modus operandi from the early 70s till this day. I will prove in this video beyond any reasonable doubt that Zanu PF has never at any time contemplated either sharing or giving up power to any political entity. In fact, from the onset, Zanu PF always preferred a total military victory, not a negotiated settlement like what happened at Lancaster in 1979. That's why you see every time when the likes of Christopher Mtswanga speak they spread this propaganda that Zanu PF won the war of liberation that is not factual the truth is the Rhodesian bush war ended in a stalemate the Rhodesian army was not defeated Zanu and Zapu didn't win the war independence was negotiated at Lancaster House in London Well of course the liberation struggle is what necessitated the Lancaster House talks but still the point remains no one won the Rhodesian Bush War Zanu PF interpreted their electoral victory in 1980 to mean that they had won the war but that's a lie it was just propaganda and they have maintained that propaganda to this day why because the liberation struggle is the manifesto of Zanu PF in every election The liberation struggle in Zimbabwe was a combination of many factors namely war activism geopolitical factors and dialogue keep in mind that the Zimbabwean liberation struggle happened during the cold war and the china soviet split zapu was trained by russia and zanu was trained by china and so the china russia split had an impact on the zapu zanu relationship The Americans were also an interested party in their bid to stop the spread of communism in Africa. And of course, the OAU and the frontline states, especially Zambia, Mozambique and Tanzania, which are countries from which the liberation struggle was fought. But you see, the frontline states led by Kaunda and Nyerere together with the OAU had long tried to force Zapu and Zanu to unite under one political party in order to avoid the danger of a civil war after independence. 
And as I said before, you can't have two different armies from one country fighting to liberate that same country and then hope that there will be peace after that country has been liberated. Kaunda and Nyerere in particular saw this danger and tried to avert it for the first time in 1974 by temporarily stopping the war through what became known as the Dayton period. This was a ceasefire to give dialogue a chance. At this stage, Rhodesia had four African political parties. Zapu led by Joshua Nkomo, Zanu led by Ndabaningi Stole, Frolizi led by James Shikerema and the ANC led by Abel Mzorewa. Please, don't confuse this ANC with the UANC. If you want to know the difference, you can watch my video titled The Leader of Zimbabwe Rhodesia. It's available on my YouTube channel. So, Kaunda in the frontline states, together with John Vosta of South Africa and the American Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, literally forced these four political parties to unite under one political entity and one leader and then go into a dialogue with Ian Smith. Zapu, Frolizi and the ANC welcomed these talks with both hands. But however, ZAN was divided. There was a faction in ZANU led by Chitepo and Mugabe which was vehemently opposed to the unity talks. This faction believed that independence would only come via the gun. But of course they had no choice but to enter into the unity talks. And as Robert Mugabe put it, Yakanga iri tamba waka chenjera. And so, ZANU signed the 1974 Unity Accord reluctantly because its Secretary General, Robert Mugabe, the Chairman, Herbert Chitepo, the Treasurer General, Enes Nkala, together with other senior leaders like Tekere and Nyagumbo, were vehemently opposed to uniting with any party and let alone ZAPU, their nemesis. So, in December 1974, these four parties signed the Zimbabwe Declaration of Unity under the banner of the ANC led by Abel Mzorewa. They all committed to holding a congress within four months to elect leaders and draft the new constitution of the ANC. But afterwards, ZANU and ZAPU differed in their interpretation of the Unity Accord. ZAPU interpreted it to mean that all the four political parties had been disbanded and replaced by the ANC. ZANU, on the other hand, interpreted it to mean that the ANC was just a vehicle for negotiating with Ian Smith and that the four political parties maintained their own identity and full autonomy. The negotiations with Ian Smith under the divided ANC produced no results. Smith was completely opposed to the idea of majority rule and ZANU was not fully committed to the talks either. Plus, Nkomo was desperately trying to take leadership of the ANC, which he eventually did, largely because ZANU was not interested in anything to do with the ANC and partly because he had the support of his friend, President Kaunda. I forgot to mention that by the time the unity talks began, Dabaningi Stole was no longer wanted by the radicals in ZANU PF. In fact, these radicals, who included Nkala, Tekere, and Nyagumbo, had already installed Robert Mugabe as leader of ZANU while he was in detention. But this was resisted by the frontline states, which insisted that the leadership change in ZANU had to come via Congress, not prison. Meanwhile, as Robert Mugabe and his faction were trying to do a coup d'etat on Stole, Thomas Nari and his boys were also trying to do a coup d'etat on Josiah Magamatongogara. What's even more interesting to note is the fact that when the Mugabe faction tried to overthrow Stole, they were resisted by Chitepo and Tongogara. Magama Tongogara insisted on Stole remaining as leader of the party. However, Ndavaningi Stole didn't reciprocate this support in the months that would follow when Tongogara was under fire from his junior commanders during the Nari rebellion. In fact, it is said that when Tongogara told Stole that the Nari boys wanted to reconstruct the high command, Stole told Tongogara to resign and go back to school if at all his junior commanders no longer respected him. This is how Magama Tongogara started warming up to the leadership of Mugabe. In fact, what made it even worse was the fact that Stole proceeded to create a new high command which excluded Tongogara and his loyalists. There is no way Tongogara would have remained loyal to Stole after that. However, regardless of the new developments in ZANU, 
The African leaders maintained that Stole remained the legitimate leader of ZANU. So, for a while, ZANU was actually led by a president it no longer wanted. Even the Mgagawa Declaration of 1975, which sealed the fate of Nabaningi Stole, did not immediately win over the frontline states, especially Samora Marshall, who actually put Robert Mgabe under house arrest for months following the assassination of Chitepo in Zambia. Tungogara and many other high-ranking ZANU officials, including members of the Darere Chimrenga, were also rounded up and imprisoned. Solomon Mujuru, who remained unarrested, played a pivotal role in getting the African leaders, particularly Samora Marshall, to accept Robert Mugabe as the new leader of ZANU. Rex Nongo, as Mujuru was known then, was part of the Zanla commanders who wrote the Mgagao declaration, but however didn't sign it as he was wanted by the Zambian authorities over the death of Chitepo. With Tongo Gara and many high command leaders arrested, Mujuru became the most senior Zanla commander out of detention. After the failure of Detente, the African leaders tried once again to unite Zapu and Zanu with the formation of a joint army of Zipra and Zanla called Zipa, led by Solomon Mujuru. Alfred Nikita Mangena of Zipra was the political commissar. Remember, at this point, most senior ZANU leaders were in detention over the death of Chitepo. Robert Mugabe and Tekere were under house arrest in Kilimane, Mozambique. The Zipa project failed dismally. Soldiers from both camps were occasionally killing each other at every opportunity. Every silly argument would end up in a gunfight. At one point, several Zipra soldiers were massacred by Zanla soldiers in an incident that was condemned by the Mozambican authorities. The ring leaders in this massacre were rounded up and arrested by the Mozambican authorities. At this point, the African leaders should have seen the disaster that was looming, the disaster that was soon to come in independent Zimbabwe. When it became clear to the African leaders that Dabaningi Stole no longer enjoyed the support of Zanla, they finally recognized Robert Mugabe as the new leader of ZANU in 1976 before the Geneva Conference, which conference again failed to produce any meaningful result. Henry Kissinger had devised a plan in which Rhodesia would have an interim government of whites and blacks for two years, which government would prepare for the holding of free and fair elections thereafter. Joshua Nkomo said that two years was a bit too long for an interim government, preferring instead nine months. But Robert Mugabe did not mince his words. He said he wanted total power, a complete immediate transfer of power. So, of the two, it's very clear who was more radical. But at least Joshua Nkomo understood one thing from the onset, that a winner-takes-all kind of an approach would be disastrous, given the volatility of relations between the three warring parties. After the failure of the Geneva Conference, African leaders continued to stress the need for unity between Zapu and ZANU. They thought that perhaps the failure of Zipa was because the political leadership of Zapu and ZANU was not united. Nyerere in particular rightly said that it would be a disaster to go to independence with two separate liberation armies. This is what led to the formation of the Patriotic Front in the run-up to the Lancaster House Conference. Nkome and Mugabe went to Lancaster under the banner of the Patriotic Front. But when they got to London, ZANU started reneging, preferring to deal with the issue of unity in Zimbabwe after the conference. And when they got to Zimbabwe, they still refused to unite with ZAPU, preferring to deal with the issue of unity after the election. You see, Robert Mugabe understood that before the election, Nkomo was an equal partner, but after the election, Nkomo would become a junior partner, especially given that ZANU was very confident of winning that election. So, it's much easier to negotiate with a junior partner than it is to negotiate with an equal partner. But as you'll see very soon, Robert Mugabe was not thinking of negotiating anything with ZAPU. The only thing on his mind was a one-party state. 
Dawengo also said that Tungugara was very upset by Mgabe's refusal to deal with the issue of unity in London. Dawengo further alleged that Tungugara actually wanted Joshua Nkomo to be the leader of the Patriotic Front and that he felt that Robert Mgabe was only good for administration. Uh, Secretary General this assertion is very consistent with Tungogara's views in 1974 when Robert Mugabe's faction tried to do a coup d'etat on Stole. Remember, Tungogara together with Chitepo supported Ndabaningi Stole against Robert Mugabe. And even if you say Dabenga was lying about Tungogara's views, one thing is very clear. Zanu played Zapu. Zanu never wanted unity. They betrayed Zapu and decided to go it alone because, number one, they believed that they didn't need Zapu in order to win the election. Number two, they wanted to establish a one-party state in Zimbabwe. Number three, all the neighboring countries who had won independence before Zimbabwe had established one-party states. Number four, the ZANU philosophy of Maoism. As I explained before, all the top Zanla cadres, particularly the top commanders, were trained in China. Tungo Gara himself was part of a 28-member delegation of Zanla cadres sent to China in 1966 for further military training. This trip was life-changing, especially for Tongo, who would later become head of Zanla. In October 1974, Rugare Gumbo led a 10-member ZANU delegation to China on a study tour which was also meant to strengthen relations with the Communist Party of China and to procure weapons. The majority of these 10 delegates who traveled to China were either senior members of the Darere Chimrenga like Rugare Gumbo himself and Kumbirai Kangai or leading Zanla commanders like Solomon Mujuru, Meya Urimbo and Zinashi Machingura. These trips to China made Zanu appreciate Maoism so much, particularly how Mao's communist party rose to power. They realized that China and Rhodesia had so many things in common. For example, China had an agrarian economy just like Rhodesia. More than 80% of Chinese people were peasants who lived in rural areas just like Rhodesia. The Chinese Communist Party had come to power in 1949 via a protracted armed struggle that lasted for over two decades. Mao's revolution was sponsored by the Russians who were keen on spreading communism all over the world. During the armed struggle, Mao differed sharply with the Russians on strategy. You see, the Russians believed that in order for a revolution to be effective, it must be ignited from the working class. But Mao vehemently opposed this. He strongly believed that the revolution in China would only be successful if ignited from the Chinese peasantry. So Mao's realization that the spark of revolution in China had to arise from the Chinese peasants became the cornerstone of his philosophy. This was a departure from classical Marxism-Leninism. Leninism in particular talks about the dictatorship of the working class, the proletariat. And for the benefit of those who might not know, Marxism is a term used to describe the theories of the German philosopher Karl Marx, who was the father of communism and socialism. So the term Marxism comes from his surname Marx. And Leninism is a word used to describe the principles of communism and socialism as practiced by Vladimir Lenin. So the term Leninism comes from his surname Lenin. So traditionally, the teachings of Marxism and Leninism said that the poor peasants in rural areas were incapable of starting a revolution. The Russian Revolution itself was ignited and pushed by the urban working class. But Mao decided to base his revolution on the dormant power of China's hundreds of millions of peasants. And that's how Maoism became its own brand of communist thought. One which would inspire and influence several African liberation movements like ZANU. Yes. Zanu even composed liberation songs that praised Mao. According to the teachings of Mao, guerrillas were supposed to look like peasants and blend in with the masses like fish in the sea. 
when Mao got into power in 1949, his policies were responsible for the death of over 40 million people due to starvation, persecution, prison labor, and mass executions, which he always justified. And what's worse is, he actually used young people to commit all kinds of heinous crimes against the elderly, particularly during the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward. You see, one of the key tenets of Maoism is the use of violence for not only obtaining power, but also sustaining it. For Mao, the end justified the means. The idea that if you think something is noble enough, then it doesn't matter how you attain it. That's what Maoism is about. And of course, I forgot to mention that China became a one-party state when Mao came to power. So that is precisely the template Zanu followed, particularly during the liberation struggle. Zanla soldiers were deployed in communities to blend in with the masses and provide them with political education. All villagers who sold out were ruthlessly killed as a deterrent to other villagers. So what it effectively meant was that the villagers were caught between a rock and a hard place. If they sold out ZANU, the guerrillas would kill them. If they failed to provide information to the government, the Rhodesian army would kill them. So either way, you died. It was pretty tough and rough. So, by the time we got to independence, ZANU had already established a fierce presence in Shona rural areas. They even deployed more ZANLA soldiers to campaign for ZANU in 1980. They stayed with the people and pressurized them into submission, especially those who either supported Muzorewa or were seen to have a soft spot for ZAPU. It's very clear that ZANU always wanted to be the sole rulers of independent Zimbabwe. That is the reason why they preferred to fight till the very end rather than negotiate. Even in those negotiations, whether you are talking of the Victoria Falls talks under the ANC, whether it's the Geneva Conference of 1976 or the Lancaster House Conference of 1979, ZANU always insisted on the principle of total transfer of power a winner takes all kind of a deal. But like I said before, there was no winner. The Rhodesian army was not defeated. So the winner takes all kind of an attitude was always never going to work. It actually took a lot of pressure and threats from Samora Machel from Gabe to sign the Lancaster House Agreement because he thought it wasn't radical enough. It's very clear, Robert Mugabe envied Kaunda's system of government. Kaunda turned Zambia into a one-party state, and so did Nyerere, Kamuz Banda, and Samora Machel. Robert Mugabe desperately wanted this in Zimbabwe, but unfortunately, Zapu was in his way. So then, this brings me to the last point of integration, which in my view provided the Sarajevo incident of Gukuraundi. So, in part 2 of this video, I will talk about how Zipra and Zanla were integrated into the new Zimbabwe National Army and the differences that existed, the grievances of Zipra soldiers and the mutiny that followed, the issue of dissidents, the arms caches, and how the 5th Brigade was formed. And as always, thank you so much for watching. And if you enjoy the content, please like and share.